Hey, everybody. It's good to see everyone's faces this morning. Uh, I hope uh, you are well this week. And it's good to be back together. A few announcements as uh, people continue to, to come in. Um, some uh, old things, a couple new orders of business. Uh, first, uh, Pastor Meg, do you want to share about uh, Godly Play and Oak Kids World this week? Yes. Um, so that Godly Play lesson for this week is um, Joseph, the story of Joseph. Hey, 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 buddy, please stop. The story of Joseph, um, Stephanie tells it and, and she does a masterful job as always. Um, and we also have a <laughs> bonus story time with Mr. Gary and uh, you do not want to miss it. And I think that's that's everything to share about what's happening this week. That's great. Thanks, Meg. Um, also, uh, we made our registration live for our Learning to Love Our Neighbors uh, training workshop. Um, Stephanie, do you want to share a little more about that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so this is going to be an opportunity to do some skill building together um, around just identifying places in our communities and in our church or in our workplaces um, or our neighborhoods where we might be, sometimes this is thought of as bystander training where you witness um, like an act or microaggression or even explicit aggression, especially around race, although the skills would apply to other situations beyond race, um, and learn how you can support um, uh, support a person of color or another marginalized person in that situation and learn um, just how to love your neighbors by responding to the situation. And so we're doing it on Sunday night and we're hoping that folks will be able to join us. And if you um, are joining us from, uh, if there's multiple people in your household who'd like to participate, the optimal situation would be for each person to have their own device. And so if you haven't done multiple Zoom videos on multiple computers in one home before, you might wanna give that a test run before, the, um, before this actual event. Great. Thanks, Steph. And, and um, uh, I just dropped a link for reg registration into that. So space is limited. Uh, we're asking $10 and you can pay through that link. And if $10 is uh, uh, difficulty or hardship for you, let us know because um, we can make it happen. Uh, we don't want uh, money to be a barrier uh, towards anyone's participation. Uh, also a reminder, as we continue to gather um, virtually uh, via Zoom, there's also an opportunity to gather physically uh, each Sunday, uh, briefly in the afternoon at 2 p.m. at El Futuro in Lakewood Shopping Center, where we share communion um, and also uh, in uh, God's Word and commun community together with some of our friends, some of whom are are in this gathering and some of whom uh, we only see on, in the afternoons during this time. Uh, we're continue to see God uh, really building up our community through this strange and hard time. Uh, and it's it's been really fun to see um, that, that group uh, continue to coalesce uh, around uh, Christ's body uh, each week. So we'd love for you to be a part. If you can do it, um, bring a mask. And, uh, and hope to see you this afternoon. Also, there are, um, uh, it has been happening regularly on Wednesday evenings, but uh, some of those times will be a little more irregular as uh, we start to lose daylight into the fall for the Oak Church Garden. And so uh, if you are interested, you can talk to uh, the farmers or uh, the Higginbotham's. Um, uh, Nan and Ned uh, um, also head that up. And so there are plenty of times throughout the week to participate 
in Oak Church Gardening if that's something that you want to be a part of. I ask Pastor Meg to lead us in our call to worship. Uh, please join me in the bold face. O oh God who created us in love, create us anew in love as we worship you. O oh Jesus Christ who redeemed this world in love, reclaim our hearts as we worship you. O oh Holy Spirit who moves this world towards its God-appointed end, move within us as we worship you. Amen. Good morning. We are now going to um, send you into breakout rooms to greet each other and get to know each other a little bit better. The prompt for today is to share just a moment of joy from the past week. It can be a big one or a tiny one. Um, just use this time to encourage each other, make sure everyone gets a chance to share, and then we'll join back together and continue in worship. I'm unmuted and the camera. <laughs> Give me one sec. Peace. Uh, okay, you can talk. I forgot what to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, just give me one second. I don't know why I can't get breakout rooms up. You're here. doing great. Does someone want to share a moment of joy as they figure out the rooms? <laughs> hey, Dana. Hey, Courtney. Hey. Hi. A moment of joy was getting some mulch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was. Hey everyone, if you're joining on Facebook, um, we're so glad that you're with us. Uh, we'd love for you to be a part of our Zoom gathering so that you can 
be uh, able to participate and see others and be seen by others. Uh, so uh, to do that, you can go to Oak Durham uh, slash uh, worship at home and um, uh, get a link from uh, Christian um, through that link. And uh, uh, if you're unable to do that and just are gathering with us uh, through Facebook, we're so glad that you're with us. Give it a sec as people continue to come back in. If you have something that you'd like to share, you can drop it in the chat comments uh, so other people outside of your breakout room can um, be a part of that. And we're gonna have Katie and Steve open us in song. So join your voices together.
to help the poor and needy and build the weak and strong. So give them songs for silence and their darkness turns to light. So condemned and dying our precious insight. Joy and hope like flowers spring in its happy birth. The tide of time shall never his covenant remove. His name shall stand forever, that name to us is love. And I will pray for us. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this. Um, we thank you for this new day that you've given us. We thank you for blessing us with the weather, the change of the seasons. Uh, we thank you that um, in the midst of a broken world, that uh, you have given us grace, uh, that you have given us a time and a place for worship and to reflect upon you and your glory, Lord. Uh, Lord, please work in our hearts this week um, so that uh, we, may, uh, we may be your people and we may be those who keep in our hearts your commandment to love one another. Uh, we pray that uh, in your wisdom, um, you will uh, use us and work through us um, so that we may give to those who don't have and that uh, we may show one another the love that you have shown us on the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll read the psalm this morning. Uh, and if you want to join me with the bold faced. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They blazed like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The word of the Lord.
apart from you, we've been all through. Oh, plant my feet down by the river. We abide, we abide in you. We abide, we abide in you. We abide, we abide in you. I mean, thanks, Katie and Steve, um, for leading us in song. Uh, last week, we got the chance to introduce uh, to you all a new face in Sadie Anderson as part of this year's um, artist residency at Oak Church, a brand new initiative um, whose the heart behind it and some of the ideas behind it aren't brand new at all, but the organization around it is new for us. And this week, uh, we are introducing uh, a less new face uh, in Bethy Figgy, who is also a resident this year um, and is going to be working with Sadie and others. Um, again, a reminder that Alex, uh, Alexandra Burchett is the congregational liaison. Um, and so if you have questions or ideas for our resident artists, uh, you can talk to her about that and uh, we'll continue to be rolling out some ways for y'all to uh, participate in their uh, residency and, and create some ways of interaction. But Bethy, I wanted uh, to open up to you to introduce yourself, tell us some of the uh, things that you make and the things that you love and some of the things that you hope for this time this year. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. It's fun to see um, your faces. Uh, I miss seeing all of you. Um, and I look forward to those of you that I don't know getting to meet some of you hopefully sooner than I think. Um, I have been going to Oak for about three and a half years, um, which is just about when I moved to Durham. Um, so it's very much been a part of my life here and um, a huge part in making Durham my home. Um, and um, as far as art goes and making things, I um, I don't know. I, I have a couple different areas that I really love. I'm a painter. I love watercolors and have been learning how to use acrylic paints in the past couple of years. Um, I am a paper crafter. I make um, stationery, um, which is a lot of fun. And um, sometimes when I'm feeling like something different, I'll uh, also get into like graphic design and digital art. And that's something I've been learning too. Um, so lots of different outlets. Um, I am really, really thankful that I get to participate in this residency. It feels like um, a surprise and um, a huge gift that has just very, very suddenly hurtled into my life. Um, and I'm really looking forward to spending some quality and rich time with the other residents and getting to know them. Um, I'm looking forward to um, brainstorming ways to bless Oak and bless all of you with um, some of the things we end up doing and exploring this year. Um, and I'm looking forward to our group coming up with a vision and, um, and digging into that. So um, yeah. Um, did I miss anything, Chris? No, that's <laughs> That's great, and and I, I just know um, how uh, thankful uh, we've been as a church, as recipients already of so many uh, ideas and execution of those ideas and furthering those ideas that we've been. Uh, you can see on the screen um, both the mural panels that are up and have been up with the wreaths, uh, Bethy, uh, like 
along with some others. And it's always Bethy and some others. It's so great. Um, uh, ran with some of those ideas. And then uh, actually right before we uh, uh, went into the quarantine and lockdown and our all of our lives were changed, uh, Bethy and Alexandra headed up the community art mural board project. And we're actually hoping to get those uh, installed here shortly to celebrate our sixth anniversary as a church. And so you can see one of those and many of y'all um, were part of that. Also, uh, Bethy mentioned some of your, your mural painting, and this is also something at the church that you all might have seen that is her work in uh, maybe a, a subtle effort for her to turn us from Oak Church into Okra Church or something like that. So, uh, but uh, uh, we're, we're really thankful for all that you already, already do and already have done and already are in the ways that you're um, going to uh, with that group and God's help um, uh, really witness to uh, hope and healing and hospitality in in tangible and beautiful ways this year. So um, be sure to um, contact Bethy and, and tell her how excited you are uh, for her to be a part of this. Follow her on socials and support her work. You can buy some of her stationery at the co-op and other places around town. And uh, we're so excited. So thanks a lot, Bethy. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pray for you real fast, and, and then we'll uh, jump into our uh, time in scripture. Uh, Lord, I give you thanks for um, artists and for those in our midst who uh, see often better than we do, uh, who see uh, beyond the things that um, cloud our, um, our vision in our hearts and in our imagination and uh, sometimes see past them, but oftentimes see through them or see that those things even better, not as things that obscure or distract us, but um, the very places where your work happens. Um, so thanks for Bethy, um, be with her and the other folks in this uh, collaborative group. Um, uh, teach them, guide them, um, create many moments of inspiration and um, new, um, new ideas and epiphanies and, um, most of all, better, um, and closer, uh, knowledge of who you are and what you're doing in us and through us and around us. We thank you for all these things and we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Uh, before we, um, jump into our scripture today, uh, I'll remind you that uh, this part of our worship gathering, we feast on the word and we ask God to nourish us with um, uh, what he tells us about um, who God is and um, what this new reality of the world is uh, in which um, Christ has died and been raised and the spirit is working in our midst. So we feast on that and we're nourished by that and we um, uh, are are bolstered by that. And then we uh, feast at the table. So I, I invite you, if you haven't, to get some elements, um, bread and wine or bread and juice or something like that from your pantry. And after our scripture time will be a time to um, share in Christ's table at our tables. I'll give you a second to gather that if, if you haven't been able to do that yet. So the scripture passage today comes from the lectionary text, and we've been in this cycle of Matthew for some time now, and it's uh, it's often fun and exciting and frustrating, these parables, and this one is particularly challenging. So uh, I'm going to invite Abby to read our scripture today, and uh, we'll um, jump in and uh, see what we, we're able to see and see what uh, God is trying to say. 
Thanks, Chris. I feel really privileged to get to read this one uh, because it is challenging and um, I'm glad that Chris warned us a little bit. I was gonna say the same thing. Um, so before we read it, um, I would just invite everybody to take a second and really open up to the discomfort that this might bring, um, especially in a time where discomfort is maybe the majority of our experience when it used to be a much smaller fraction of our time, this can be really confronting. But I think that Christ and the Holy Spirit is here to help us here with aligned and open hearts and ears. And um, also just as a reminder before we read this is that anger is the emotion that informs us when our values have been violated, um, which is different than discomfort. Um, but I think those are two really key things that we need to be ready for before we hear this. So listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and he put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower. And then he rented it to tenant farmers and took a trip. When it was time for harvest, he sent his servants to the tenant farmers to collect his fruit. But the tenant farmers grabbed his servants and they beat some of them and some of them they killed and some of them they stoned to death. Again, he sent other servants more than the first group and they treated them in the same way. And finally, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenant farmers saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come on, let's kill him and we'll have his inheritance. And they grabbed him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenant farmers? And they said, he will totally destroy those wicked farmers and rent the vineyard to other tenant farmers who will give him the fruit when it's ready. But Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it's amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that God's kingdom will be taken away from you and will be given to a people who produce its fruit. Whoever falls on this stone will be crushed and the stone will crush the person it falls on. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard the parable, they knew Jesus was talking about them. They were trying to arrest him, but they feared the crowds who thought he was a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks so much, Abby. So as you probably could hear in that sermon, uh, a challenging text and actually one of those texts that seems like a great idea when you put it on the schedule until it comes up that week and you realize what you've done to yourself. But that's also uh, one of the strengths of um, the canon of the Bible in general and the lectionary in particular is that you might actually encounter texts that you wouldn't choose for yourself and you're forced to uh, deal with that. Um, uh, it's, it's funny in my, in my research for the sermon over and over, uh, commentators and other preachers, um, listed, and I don't know if they got this thought from each other or if everyone's seminary training generated this thought independently, but the amount of times that they quoted, uh, reformer Martin Luther about this passage, this is like the go-to, so I'm going to continue in that tradition about this passage. They said that Martin Luther, uh, as once said that sometimes you have to squeeze a biblical passage until it leaks the gospel. <laughs> uh, it's not necessarily readily apparent. And so um, while I don't know that we necessarily have to work that hard, sometimes the, the best way to hear the gospel is to do less rather than more. Um, I, I, I do think that this is a challenging passage for us. And because it was challenging, um, I don't know that it, it lent itself for me in preparing and as I was learning and submitting to it for a, a really like 
tightly packaged, coherent uh, sermon message on this. So I'm going to do something a little different, and I'm going to kind of walk or ask, walk with you or ask you all to walk with me uh, through some of the major questions that we might have of this passage. Um, uh, that I was struggling and struggling and struggling, and then I, I just thought, well, what are the questions that we're asking here? Um, and these are, these are pretty good questions when you encounter any sort of parable. So maybe we'll gain some, some tools. And, and of course, these parables are these, these stories, these microcosms, these new worlds that Jesus creates in order to uh, shake us and break us out of um, like binary thinking or um, uh, the way things are or our old mentalities into something new. So there's, there's so many uh, ways that we can keep returning to these parables and hear more and more and more and see more and more and more. So first off, why a vineyard? It feels um, like a good time to be reading these um, agricultural parables. This fall season of harvest is a time when, when we can see all around us the um, coming to fruition of um, a year's growth and planting before the fallow barrenness of the winter time. But there's a, a very specific reason here why Jesus uses a vineyard. And unless you grew up in maybe like Northern California or even like the uh, Virginian hillsides, you might not have direct um, access or experience with vineyards. But when, when Jesus starts talking about a vineyard to his audience. If it, even if it doesn't ring to us, to them, it would ring of like a to be continued image of an ancient image of Israel, of, of God's chosen people. Consider Isaiah five. We really like Isaiah around here. We get our name from Isaiah 61, uh, but there are also uh, parts of Isaiah that we don't tend to read nearly as much. Take, for instance, Isaiah 5, which is a whole um, prophet's song about the vineyard. In your Bible, it, you might have a little uh, heading note that, that calls it the vineyard song. It, it goes a little something like this. I won't attempt to sing it, but it says, let me sing a song uh, for my loved one, a love song for his vineyard. The loved one is 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 maybe uh, Isaiah's God, or it's maybe the people uh, to, for whom Isaiah loves. He says, in this case, it's God. He says, my loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it, cleared away its stones, planted it with excellent vines, built a tower inside of it, and dug out a wine vat in it. Does this sound familiar to Jesus' sermon? And then he goes on to say, he expected it to, to grow good grapes, but it grew rotten ones. He expected it to grow good grapes, but it grew rotten ones. I think we might start to be catching on as to why the vineyard. <laughs> Isaiah 5 then, then goes into this really detailed and strange and kind of scary list about what, those, what that rotten fruit is, what those rotten grapes are. Um, for instance, uh, this is all Isaiah 5. Uh, you're growing rotten grapes if you acquire house after house, if you annex field after field until there is no space. Greedy, property-grabbing, um, crushing the poor is upsetting to this vision of a thriving, verdant vineyard. You're growing rotten grapes if you, uh, quote, wake up early in the morning to run after beer, or stay up late to be lit up by wine, people controlled by spirits and not the spirit. You're growing rotten grapes if you drag guilt along with cords of fraud and who rush God. You're growing bad grapes if you call evil good and good evil, darkness light and light darkness, bitterness sweet and sweetness bitter. You see this alternate reality in which you're like, gaslighting people about the things of God. 
or you're growing rotten grapes if you consider yourself wise and clever and are fooling yourself. You're considered growing bad grapes if you're a quote, and this is a deep burn from Isaiah, a wine swigging warrior, right? Um, th those are the things of bad grapes. Uh, also, you might consider why a vineyard shows up in Psalm 80. Uh, something similar to what we sang with Katie earlier, restore us, God Almighty, make your face shine upon us that we might be saved. You transplanted a vine from Egypt and drove out the nations and you planted it. You cleared the ground for it, it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. Its branches reach as far as the sea and it shoots as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all may pass by and pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it and insects from the fields feed upon it. Return to us, God Almighty, and look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root that your hand has planted, your son, um, that, uh, the son that you yourself have raised up. So we can see this image for Israel, this, um, this vine and vineyard that has gone wrong and is being picked off and, and not um, growing the way that it should. So that gives us a little bit of a sense of why a vineyard. Um, next question I had and maybe you had was, who is the landowner? Who is the landowner? Maybe that's the easier question of all this. It's, it's God, probably. <laughs> but maybe not a great look for God. Maybe a seemingly far away and distant God, an absentee landlord God. And I think about all the metaphors for God, images for God, some, some which um, are really hard for us. You know, when we, when we call God father, it's great if you had a good dad. It's potentially damaging if you had an abusive one. Or when we call God master, um, that's, uh, that's fraught with all sorts of problematics to um, uh, enslavement and, and violence. Um, but also we get these wonderful images of God, uh, even as father, even as landowner, even as householder, like uh, the image in um, Jesus's parable in Luke 15 of the prodigal son being greeted by this loving land-owning father who becomes undignified because of his own joy for the return of his lost one. Um, we think of the image of God as a mother hen um, shielding and gathering God's chicks, uh, God's little ones under the protection of God's wings. Um, but this image in our parable today of a landowner is tricky. Uh, it's, it's tricky, um, especially like I think of the context of an article this week that came out in our local newspaper in the Indie Week of about um, uh, the vast percentage of modern Durham that is being owned by people outside of Durham. Uh, like I talked about in the last 20 years, uh, our, our our property in Durham has shifted from 65% of our commercial land being held by owners inside of the state of North Carolina to now 75% of all these new apartment buildings are owned by out of state and out of towners. And this is a really startling shift because it means that money and influence and even like care and um, understanding of the community isn't located here and doesn't stay here. So in the parables world, it's not difficult to see that there are negative effects with this sort of distance between the landowner and the owned land. We see this even in our own bull city. Maybe another question that you're having as you're reading this is who are the servants? Who are the messengers? I think answering this relies a lot on who Jesus's audience is. It seems to be a really tense Jerusalem scene in the last week of Jesus's life. Everyone is, has gone up to Jerusalem 
um, for the Passover pilgrimage. So you have all these pilgrims and all these major religious leaders, and they're all hearing these words, these stories. And this is the second parable of a set. Jesus is continuing to drill down and maybe even get more intense. They're all coming um, from someone who has been welcomed into this major city, the epicenter of their religious and political life, Jerusalem. They're coming from this person who had been welcomed into that city on the back of a donkey to hosannas and palm branches like a messiah. This is a, a really, this is a political season that maybe a month out from the election, we can begin to understand the sort of tension that is happening. Every word from Jesus is being parsed and scrutinized. Everyone has a stake in what's going on. The previous parable to this one dealt with questions of Jesus's authority, who uh, not just um, but the authority by which someone speaks, um, Jesus is, is shifting in them, comes not from what they do, but by the one who sent them. And he's claiming divine authority as the one who God is, is imparting words through. And Jesus is being vested with quite a bit of influence. He's becoming the voice of the voiceless peasants who are gathering around him. And so now he's navigating a world of power brokers who are both religious and political. And let's be honest, the political and the religious are often very kind of hand in glove, maybe even fist in glove. And so as Jesus begins to speak of servants from the householder being killed, their ears might have perked up. There's a long lineage of prophets of God, these servants, these messengers being killed for messaging truth. I mean, confer just to the Isaiah 5 pa passage that we, we started with and these harsh words for these sinful things that are happening. These prophets, when they speak, they're speaking from within the people of God. And they're often, they're also speaking on behalf of God. So they're doing this, this God and humanity double duty. They're speaking from within God's people to God's people on behalf of God and often to the powerful. The prophet's words are most often spoken as truth to power. This is contrasted maybe with how often we're used to, especially in America, um, having powerful people trying to mobilize prophetic words against people, not from within the people, but over and above and against people to maintain or to expand power. The powerful both in and outside of the church should always then have a complicated relationship with the prophets. We should have a complicated relationship with the prophets as people with some power and influence and privilege. If we too easily dismiss the prophet's words, we reject the one who sends them. If we too easily accept the prophet's words, it's likely that we didn't hear what they're really trying to say to us, who they're trying to lift up, the God whom they're speaking for, who is calling the nations to repentance. I think of the line with this, of, uh, it was just a little line in an Arcade Fire song that he says, never trust a millionaire quoting the Sermon on the Mount. I used to think I was not like them, but I'm beginning to have my doubts. So there was this unsettling when you start to hear the words of things like the Sermon on the Mount or words from the prophets, and that should be unsettling. If you ever hear a prophet, make sure you listen long enough for them to make you mad or uncomfortable. If you ever hear a prophet, make sure you listen long enough for them to make you mad or uncomfortable. Don't block them, don't mute them, just let them speak. This is the sort of thing for which John the Baptist lost his head over, this sort of dangerous vocation of speaking amongst God's people for God to power. And maybe another question we have of this are, who are the tenants? Well, the tenants are God's people. 
in the original hearing, they're Israel. It's the peculiar people of God from among the nations called to witness to the nations. Israel was to be the tip of the spear for the salvation of the world. They, they were in Abraham's calling, blessed to be a blessing. This being the origin and purpose of God's people, we see the inherent criticism that's happening in this parable, that God's people have begun to bottleneck the blessings of God. They become stiff-necked and therefore unable to look around at the array and wideness of God's creation and the desire and love that God has for its flourishing. It's hard not to contextualize this criticism for our times and our calling as ones graciously grafted into Israel's vocation as God's people in Christ. We've become something we've never been meant to be, to narrow, too self-centered, too unimaginative for the God of the universe, the God of the nations, the God who wills that all be saved and the God who is preparing a feast of the lamb at a long table. This is the image we get from Revelation. A feast for all people in the presence of the lamb. So this parable of Jesus communicates this uh, Robert Farr Capen calls this strange kind of againstness. A strange kind of againstness of a God that is actually being in Christ utterly for us. Not for us to continue in our sin, but for us having just at the right time died for us as sinners. That Jesus died with and for us, even as we'd most likely be the ones who put Jesus to death over and over again with our violence and our blindness and our self-supremacies that can't see or can't handle that Jesus is Lord and rules with grace and peace. This is why this parable is so hard because it comes with a scandal and the scandal is in, in the words of Psalm 118. that Jesus is the stone the builders rejected and the chief cornerstone. That the, the, the very one, the key one who holds all things together is hidden in plain sight to us most of the time. We don't recognize the most important one in the world, Jesus. The Apostle Paul uses language like this in 1 Corinthians 1. That the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but the power of God for us who are being saved. He says, Jews ask for signs, Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is the scandal to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Christ is both God's power and God's wisdom. Foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. All this with the parable is to say that God gives us exactly what we need and want in precisely the way we didn't ask for it or expect it. God gives us what we need and want, but in ways that we often don't ask for or expect in ways that we often can't recognize or make sense of. So we stumble and we reject rather than build and grow. The, the parable, this weird, strange, violent parable, is a like wide-eyed, wild-eyed um, story about the stakes of all this. The rejection of God's work in the world often seems so mild to us. We reject, our neighbors reject the love of God, and it seems like a small thing that we can take or leave. But the parable exposes us. It exposes the the very real violence associated with what happens when we purge our lives of that sort of gentle grace. God comes in gentleness and we reject it. And we don't just reject it in a way that it never comes back around to us, but we will kill God's gentle grace. And this parable itself has been used historically in violent ways against the Jewish people. The the reasoning being something like the Jews 
um, kill the one sent from God, even God's son. And so the Jews need to be held accountable. And it's really, it's really gross. It's, it's, it, but the, the logic normally stops short of implicating ourselves in that, in that same logic that a rejection of the Prince of Peace inevitably gives way to unpeace, that no one is immune to this sort of violence. The key is to read yourself squarely inside of this parable as one capable of rejecting the owner of the vineyard, capable of killing his messengers, even capable of the twisted logic that would kill his son. This is our story. This is the way we reject the cornerstone and stumble over the scandal of God's generative and present love to us. We just over and over think that it's not possible for us to be that way. It's, it's often so difficult for us to see. We, we do this so often um, when we, um, we're, we become really good, especially in America, um, with just a little bit of time in between of turning like killed revolutionaries into harmless nice guys in our memories. Uh, this is, it made me think of how Jesus lives in a pantheon with like the early Christian martyrs who we often romanticize, but also like latter religious figures like Gandhi or Oscar Romero or the Reverend uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. I think we're satisfied with some quotable quotes, some like maybe even like a Monday off of work, some commemorative swag, like a boulevard or a postage stamp in their honor, but no real recognition of why anyone would ever be so threatened by these people that they would want to erase them. We do that with Jesus too. We come up with theologies about what Jesus' death means for the forgiveness of our sins without much of a recognition that he was such a threat that he had to be eliminated by both the religious authorities and the political powers of his day. To whitewash legacies of people like this, like Jesus, with Jesus, is to fail to implicate ourselves in their deaths and is to actually oppose their work rather than join it. It is to reject and to stumble rather than to build and to grow. It's uh, Oscar Romero, I just mentioned, is, is one of these people. And he talks about God's word um, and the way that we often treat it lightly. And Oscar Romero was a, a Catholic priest in San Salvador who worked on behalf of, of the poor and the workers in his country and was assassinated after giving a sermon um, about God's uh, identification and, and uh, nearness to those who were hurting around him. And he was assassinated as he was celebrating the Eucharist at a hospital chapel. And Oscar Romero talks about this word and he says, it's very easy to be servants of the word without disturbing the world. It's a very spiritualized word, a word without any commitment to history, a word that can be, uh, that can sound in any part of the world because it belongs to no part of the world. It's a word that creates no problems. It starts no conflicts. What starts conflicts and persecutions, what marks the genuine church is the word that burning like the word of the prophets proclaims and accuses. It proclaims to the people God's wonders to be believed and venerated and accuses of sin those who oppose God's reign so that they may tear that sin out of their hearts and out of their societies and out of their laws, out of the structures that oppress, that imprison, that violate the rights of God and of humanity. This is the hard service of the word. This is the hard service of this parable word to us. And it is also, if we're, if we're following Martin Luther, there's plenty of good news to be crushed and wrought out of this hard service of the word. It doesn't have to be this way. There's held out a very 
good news, a very real possibility that something fruitful can still come out of all this. Something beautiful and sweet can still grow. The answer to the listeners of this parable is to whom are they going to give the, the operations of the vineyard? And Jesus answers to a people who produce the kingdom's fruit. This is our calling to be people who produce the kingdom's fruit. This is our calling to, to join the spirit in this labor, to bear fruit. And when, like in Galatians, uh, when in Galatians, when they talk about fruit and all these fruits of the spirit, they're not different varieties of fruit. You don't get to choose which one you're good at or which one you want. They're all, um, they're not different kinds of fruit. They're all different manifestations of the very same fruit of the kingdom. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That passage in Galatians says, against these things, there is no law. Because in the kingdom of God, these things are the law. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control. And if we know anything about fruit, if you've spent any time in the Oak Church Garden, if you even thought long enough when you're in the grocery store buying fruit, fruit isn't automatic. Fruit isn't quickly wrought. Fruit is the product of so much forethought, of so much planting, of so much cultivation, of so many of the right conditions for growth, so much of the guarding for harvest until ripe, fruit comes from discipline and discernment and steadfastness and anticipation. To be people who produce the kingdom's fruit is to be people who are dead set on living verdant, fruitful lives, lives um, which promote more life, life that begets life in healing and more life in others rather than violence and scarcity and defensiveness and death. Fruit is, fruit is both the cause and the effect, the byproduct of health. We eat a lot of fruit, we're going to be healthy people, but fruit also comes from a healthy plant. Fruit nourishes, fruit celebrates, fruit isn't fearful. Fruit is part of the feast. So friends, with Jesus, let us imagine a world beyond the world of the parable. Sometimes the parable, uh, in the parables, Jesus tells a story of a world that doesn't exist. And sometimes in stories like this one today, Jesus tells us of a world that is even more real than our world with all of its violence. But let's imagine with Jesus uh, the photo negative of this world, the world that God is making possible, the world where the owner of this year vineyard, our God, isn't all that absent, but is faithfully and immensely present to us. Kingdom of God is at hand. We just need to reach out to God and he's right there. That we can imagine a world in which the violence of this world isn't perpetuated, but is absorbed by the death of the sun and not returned into circulation, but rather Jesus's death makes an end of retribution and makes inheritance and flourishing possible for many. When in a moment when we share in communion together, we'll say that uh, this is the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of the sins of many. There is a, a expansive and generative and exponential um, property to Jesus's death and Jesus's resurrection. And, and also we can imagine a world in, in using these questions that we've, we've posed and begun to answer, uh, we can imagine a world in which we're um, a faithful growing vineyard. 
like uh, that Jesus's death brings about life and it brings forth this new reality. Second Corinthians five says, if anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. We are new creatures and there is new creation. And this new reality is the, the beginning to realize an, another one of the prophet's words, the prophet Micah. And these words were made popular in the American imagination by George Washington, but they were given rhythm and rhyme more recently by Lynn manuel Miranda and Hamilton. And, and so we have these hopes that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree and no one among them shall be afraid. This is the world that we hope for and that we imagine and that we begin to embody as, as workers in the vineyard, um, as, as workers with Christ, as those who are growing in the fruits of the spirit. Will you all pray with me? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this hard word, and we thank you for the hard service of the word. Give us courage to be examined by and implicated by this word, Lord, in the violent, resistant, stumbling parts of our heart. Um, this week, help us root those things out, um, that we might grow in in gentleness, in patience, in all of that fruit that you are desiring to bear in us uh, for our good and for the good of others. Lord, we thank you for your, your grace that is so subtle and persistent that we can often miss it, that we can reject your work um, even as it's foundational and fundamental for who we are and where this world is going. Give us eyes, give us ears, give us hearts open and ready to receive your word and your work in our lives. We pray all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite Stephanie to lead us in our prayers of the people. Can you please join me in prayer? Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we pray, than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Should we do the confession or the prayers of the people? Okay. We can pray together, sorry. Okay, no worries. Um, so now's the time for you to be able to share your prayers out loud if you want to. Um, just remember to unmic your unmute your microphone first, and um, if you can go ahead and end your prayer with "Lord in your mercy" and hear our prayer. If someone else is in the room with you, they could say "Hear our prayer" for you, and um, then you can go ahead and mute your mic again when you're finished, and I'll open and close us. Lord, this passage is indeed um, confusing and hard. Um, just like Abby said at the beginning today of hearing your word and entering into your word together. And I wonder if the words of Oscar Romero should be turned into our prayer, that we would be people who disturb false peace, that we would, um, that we would get into good trouble, as John Lewis would say, and that we would be people who would um, proclaim truth and proclaim hard truths 
to um, people in power. For some of us, that's ourselves. And for some of us, that's people who can um, significantly impact our lives. We pray that you would give us courage um, to be able to see the truth about ourselves and our communities and the systems that we find ourselves in. And that you would, um, through the power of your Holy, Holy Spirit, give us the wisdom and just foolish bravery to be able to resist those systems and to um, disturb the world around us and to point that towards you. Lord, in our prayer, Lord, in our, your mercy, hear our prayer. Dear God, I uh, offer my deep thanksgiving for the five-year-old in my lap. Thank you, God, for every day that we have had with Samuel Isaac and all of the laughter and the fun and the snuggles and the Legos that we have had. Um, Thank you for opportunities for joy, even in uh, what can be very overwhelmingly dark times. Lord, in your mercy. Uh, our kind and gracious, most loving Father in the heavens, once again, we come to you with humble hearts, give you thanks, bring you honor, bring glory and praise to you and your son. We thank you for this day that you assembled us together to bring worship and praise to you. We thank you for the past days that we've been through things, trials and sufferings and tough times and all things. And we thank you mostly of all for keeping us together and keeping us united through our prayer, through our thoughts, through our memories, and our gatherings for our church. We want to also give you thanks and praise for the ultimate sacrifice of your son bringing light into the world and giving us a chance to be redeemed as your children. We always try to imitate the ways of you and your son, offer hope, healing, and hospitality. But most of all, people treat people in the kindest ways and show love and true peace that you and your son have. But we always be mindful and thankful to show gratefulness and appreciation to our pastor, our church members, brothers and sisters, and may we continue to try to teach and watch our little ones grow and give love, respect, kindness, and the wisdom, courage, and all the things that are instilled in their leaders and teachers through us. Most of all, we want to thank you again for this time that you allowed us today to come together as a group and unite as a church and as a family. We pray all this in the mighty name of our Savior, our Lord, and our King, your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our prayer. Heavenly Father, um, I want to pray this morning for uh, all of the students who are about halfway through a very weird semester um, and are trying to stay focused and constant in their studies in the midst of a very unconstant uh, world and confusing time. Um, none of our teachers uh, or mentors or colleagues are prepared to uh, shape us to work and serve in the world that we will graduate into. Um, and that's a really confusing thing. Um, so God, I pray that you will um, 
equip us, make us alert, ready to learn and adapt um, to the needs of the world that we will be sent out into um, as students. And uh, God help us to focus on our studies when um, there's so much else to focus on right now. Um, yeah, just allow us peace and uh, concentration and trust during this time. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, I also pray for this country that I find myself in and for the that many people find themselves in. Uh, it's, a, it's a conflicting time for us. Uh, I feel, um, while well, I, uh, and uh, with the first presidential debate, it revealed only even more disturbing things. Father, I pray for the return of virtue in our public discourse, in our political discourse. Um, I know it's not easy, but um, Please remind some of us and through us remind more um, how important it is to actually carry on our daily lives with hope and, and the willingness to listen, which seems to be especially on short supply these days. Open our ears and open our hearts, Lord, and make us and make our leaders willing to listen and make us and make our leaders humble. Um, and I especially pray for uh, the many wise members in the Chinese church that I have spent a lot of time with, uh, people whom I have respected immensely in the past, yet during this election has shown utter inability to think independently for themselves and not towing the party line. This is difficult, Father. Um, but I pray for healing and hope in the midst of it all. Mm -hmm. Knowing that even the worst we can do cannot cancel the victory that you have already won for us on the cross. And if we can be of any help to witness in any way that that really would proclaim your hope and your virtue in this world, then let us do so. But in the very least, Remind us of the hope that you are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, I pray for your continued work and presence um, in our lives during the pandemic. I feel like I keep forgetting and then reminding myself and um, as well as with other people that we are um, experiencing such a, a, a global tragedy and um, I pray that you would um, and equipping us with grace for ourselves and for others when we are not feeling our best or not feeling ourselves when we are um, struggling and, and continuing to adjust to the world being different um, even when we don't realize it. Um, I pray you would um, continue to bring hope and strength and comfort um, when we find ourselves worrying about so many different things. Um, I feel worried um, headed into the fall and winter, um, just knowing that COVID numbers are supposed to be worse and wondering what community time looks like when being outside is harder. And um, would you please Hold those fears and worries and the unknowns of the coming months and um, thank you that you will always continue to be with us um, in the pandemic and in every other difficulty we face. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our Lord, we pray for our health and healing in our country and world and city. We pray for our president and officials who are sick. And um, we pray for um, those in our neighborhoods who are sick or sad or scared. Uh, Lord, we um, give us, um, give us expanding hearts for uh, people who are hurting. Um, help us um, not feel like we need to um, uh, explain or chide, um, but um, help us also have a vision for how even um, sickness and unhealth um, can um, bear witness and be um, a place um, for your um, glory and healing and power to uh, be present. I, I think of the story of, of the, uh, the many healing stories in which they ask why, why sickness and, and uh, Jesus reframes the question with an answer that it might be that God's God be glorified. Um, so we pray for that. Um, even as we don't understand, even as we uh, often act um, with some mixture of vigilance and fear. Uh, we pray your blessing on these people and on us. Lord, in your mercy. Dear God, we know that you our prayers and that you love us so deeply we pray that we will sense your love for us and that you will give us the ability to see your image in ourselves and our families and our friends and our enemies um just every day in your name amen you join me as we confess together Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And friends, the good news is um, not only that we are forgiven and given mercy, but that also we are included uh, with uh, those great cloud of witnesses um, in our time um, uh, everywhere um, and beyond. And so we join with them in a chorus of uh, folks um, who uh, believe in the triune God. And so join me, with me in our creed. We believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, friends, I invite you to uh, gather the elements um, that you have at your disposal. as we share in this remembering meal. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his disciples for a Passover feast and he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, 
and he gave it to them. He said, take and eat. This is my body for you. A little while later, he also took the cup and he blessed it and gave it to them and said, take and drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of many. As often as you drink it, remember me. And pray with me. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for this feast. These ordinary things um, from our pantries and our homes that you've made extraordinary and that you've called us uh, to join you at your table together. Lord, feed us this um, bread, this cup, uh, fruit of the field and fruit of the vine, uh, your very body and blood. You are the good vine that um, you've called us and grafted us into and in that you allow us to abide and flourish in your life through our lives. Thanks for feeding us and nourishing us and calling us to lives of fruitfulness. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, is Christ's body and blood for you. So as we go this week, I want to uh, just remind you about the workshop training and your ability now to register and participate in that. Uh, we also look forward to, um, if, if you're part of Oak Kids or if you're looking to be a part of Oak Kids, even without an Oak Kid, you can access uh, a wonderful lesson from Stephanie. Uh, you can also access uh, an amazing story read by Gary of uh, Martin Luther King and Mahalia Jackson uh, with beautiful illustrations done from Oak Garden so you can further situate yourself um, back at the church. Um, it's so good to be with you all. Thanks uh, also just on a personal note for your prayers and your um, kind words after uh, a rough week last week um, and uh, thanks for continuing to show up uh, throughout the week um, for each other, for me, for uh, so many. Um, it's good to uh, be back on here and, and uh, know um, that God is even using uh, something like that to draw us together and, and, um, and draw us to, to God himself. So uh, thank you all for being a part of that. I was encouraged this week, uh, even as I was really discouraged last week. Um, so friends, go this week, go um, in a posture and an expectation to uh, be ones who might bear the kingdom's fruit. Um, go with open eyes and go with open hearts, even hearts that um, uh, might um, not be prepared for the word that God is going to unsettle you with. Um, but friends, go together in Jesus' name. Amen.